Welcome to week five, where we're going to talk about how should individuals attempt to try to achieve healthy, sustainable, and equitable food systems. So what roles do individuals have? So let's get started. So on this first module, we'll talk about individual action and does it matter? There's a lot of debate on whether or not personal decisions or individual actions can make a difference when we're thinking about grand global challenges like climate change or like the affairs of the health system. So you often hear a lot of debate around, should we fly less? Should we drive less? Should we eat a more plant-based or flexitarian diet to save the planet? But others argue that personal actions are pointless. They're a drop in the bucket, a drop in the ocean. When we think about the huge systemic changes that need to happen in order to mitigate climate change. But is this a false dichotomy? Many would argue, contrarily, that individual action is critical because it is so much part of the collective. Now. Those who argue the drop in the ocean uh, stance, you'll see this figure on the right shows the percentage of CO2 emissions by world population with the wealthiest 10% in the world responsible for almost half of total lifestyle consumption emissions. So if the world were to move towards trying to reduce their greenhouse gas footprint, does it matter so much when the 10% of the wealthiest are the ones making the biggest contributions to climate change. So why would the poor need to uh, feel responsible for that 10% of the wealthy? And there's a solid argument to be had there, but we can argue that if those 10% of individuals actually uh, change their behavior, maybe it wouldn't be a drop, maybe it'd be a liter of, of water in the ocean, but still individual action can make a difference. And, and why do we need individual action? Why is it even important? Well, there's four arguments for why. One is that individual action is crucial for credible communication. That means that if you want your family members or your friends or your coworkers to understand, let's say there's a climate emergency going on, which there is, we had better signal through our own actions that we truly believe that the emergency is real. So right now, they have the Black Lives Matter movement rising in the United States and around the world. Uh, what a better way to show that there is injustice, there is racial issues in the country by protesting, contributing to the bailout of, of individuals, protesters who've been put um, in jail and have been arrested. By, by participating and acting you too are showing that this is an issue that needs to be dealt with. The second thing is that individual action leads to a new normal. People learn to change when they see others doing it. So individual cha change is leading by example. Again, you can demonstrate to your family, friends, coworkers, colleagues that the change is practically feasible. People in, the, in their immediate circle are doing it and that it's a decision that the direct, it's a direction that maybe the world wants to go in. And, and it's important to learn, read, and listen about it. So cr create the new norm. The third is individual action leads to collective action. Once you personally engage in something, walking the walk, putting your body and actions in motion to advance this cause, you become braver and more willing to reach out to others to ask them to change to. And the fourth is individual action enables learning by doing. This is something interesting. When you try to do something, even if you don't succeed the first time, people talk, they communicate, you troubleshoot, you learn, and you try again. 
And just to show that individuals can matter, this is showing you the contribution of consumption of different items or categories to carbon and orange, land and green, material and water footprints in the EU. And what this shows is the categories are quantities of products bought, so measured as expenditure per capita in the EU, and then the footprint intensities of those categories. And what you see by expenditure per capita and these footprints, that different categories have big contributions on an individual level. So in the case of carbon, it's mobility, so cars, shelter, products. In, in land, material, and water footprint, it's food that becomes incredibly important contributors individually to these footprints. Clothing and footwear, manufactured products, also big contributors. So individuals themselves, depending on how they live their lives, can contribute significantly to climate and environmental footprints. And this slide shows you emission reductions with individual action. So what can you do as an individual that will make the biggest impact on greenhouse gas emission reductions? And this was a study looking at several countries uh, in the developed world. So US, Russia, Japan, Australia, Canada, Belgium, uh, uh, Great Britain, the EU, the Netherlands, um, et cetera, and showing that the height of the bar means those uh, that uh, contribute the most and have the highest impact are in green, moderate impact is blue, and yellow impact is, is low impact on greenhouse gas emissions. And the, the black lines uh, indicate the mean values of those specific countries. So what is the single biggest contributor that an individual can make to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions is having one less child, something that no one wants to talk about. You get into quickly ethical dilemmas when you think about family planning, reproductive rights, etc. The second is living car free. The third is avoiding one transatlantic flight. Third is green energy, buying a more efficient car like a Prius, Plant-based diet is lower, as you can see. And then recycling, using upgraded, you know, more efficient light bulbs are, are quite uh, marginal. And I just wanted to give an example of how individual action can really shape the food system. Well, we think about gluten anxiety. So this is an individual action or a demand that can completely shift the supply. So how did gluten massive uh, ingredient in staple foods that has sustained humanity for years become so bad, so threatening, so detrimental to human health. And there's really no scientific data yet to demonstrate that millions of people have become allergic or intolerant or sick from gluten or to other wheat proteins. But consumers are convinced that gluten is bad, it's bad for health, it's bad for... it. it causes weight gain. And you can see this massive increase in the supply chain in reformulation of products, changing wheat varieties that are grown around the world, restaurants changing their menus, offering gluten-free products in Italy, um, you know, a lot of gluten-free products on the shelves in Italian supermarkets in Italy where gluten traditionally reigned. So this is a perfect example or something in the demand side, consumers, individuals have decided that something's bad for them and it has completely reshaped the supply. And there's many examples where demand can be quite powerful in shaping private sector and supply chains. But none of this means anything. Um, and, and if, if, if everything is left to the individual. You'll often hear this argument that change can only happen when individuals decide to do so. It's not really true. We need systemic changes. We need governments to take action, which we're gonna talk about in week six.
So welcome to module 5.2, where we're going to talk about education and knowledge and does it spur behavior change. So let's get started. So to predict or change behavior, you need to really understand a person's beliefs, their attitudes, and their intentions. So does nutrition education change behavior? Well, some studies have looked at this. And it's a bit inconclusive. It's not always so straightforward, but there are some best practices and nutrition education interventions really depend on some specific factors such as interventions need to last a bit long. They can't be so acute, they need to last for half a year. You need to be very limited in the objectives. You can't try to achieve and try to do so much in an intervention. So intervention should have two, three objectives at most. Interventions need to be appropriately designed for the target group. They need to be specific to the context of where you're working. You need to have solid evidence of those interventions that you're undertaking. And of course, support from policymakers on interventions are critically important. So just as a case study, this is looking at nutrition education in schools in a low middle income context. And this was a systematic review looking at the impact of nutrition education in schools, targeting adolescent teenagers ages 10 to 18 years of age in, in the low and middle income context. And these were done in school, which is considered one of the places where you can make the biggest impact on uh, with, with nutrition education. And what they found when they looked at the impact of nutrition education on dietary intake, as well as body mass index, that nutrition education did matter. It did change dietary intake, and in some cases, body mass index. But when they looked across the different studies that took this on, the nutrition education varied. Components of interventions that had an impact on these two outcomes included things where programs were facilitated by the school staff and by teachers and principals. Uh, there was an impact when parents were involved and engaged and had some voice. And that where there was a, a long chain of evidence and, and logical framing of these interventions. In addition, canteens or school cafeteria changes, uh, the types of foods that were available, and the restriction of vending machines or changing what was available in vending machines towards healthier products also showed improvements in positive dietary intake changes. Another nutrition education approach that's been tested and tried a lot in the field in low and middle income contexts are home gardens. Helen Keller International has done a lot on home gardens, trying to improve homestead food production. And what they found was that home gardens alone did not necessarily improve dietary diversity and quality, as well as nutrition outcomes like body mass index or childhood growth. But what did make an impact, at least on improving dietary intake, was when home gardens were paired with nutrition education. And this graph shows you uh, the linkages in home gardens or homestead food production to the potential contributions in improvements. And the gray box is showing you different outcomes, but nutrition education is really key in contributing to seeing benefits of, of, across uh, different populations for dietary diversity. But there's ever-growing complexity in what consumers or citizens face when they try to eat healthy and sustainable. They're increasingly being asked to make really complex choices about the foods they eat, where they come from, are they sustainable, are they healthy? There's also growing scientific complexity of food production and processing which has placed more burden on consumers to understand food sciences and what it all means. 
The media is also at fault. They inundate consumers with very confusing messages about the health of our diets or the sustainability of our diets. But it's incredibly confusing for consumers because latest findings can often change. Some messages on nutrition, such as eating more fresh produce, fruits and vegetables, consuming less salt, consuming less sugar, have been largely consistent throughout the decades. But when you start to look at the nuances of specific types of foods, it gets very confusing. One of the most confusing spaces is the area of sustainability. And when you just think about the navigation that consumers have to undertake, it's quite, it's quite perplexing to them. And here's a survey uh, looking, I believe this is in the U.S., showing um, how consumers feel about conflicting information. They receive a lot of conflicting information about what foods they should eat or avoid. And they also receive conflicting information about what they should be eating um, that makes them doubt the choices they make. So there, there's a need for, for bringing clarity for consumers on how to, to navigate this space. Things like this, the New York Times, where coffee is good for you one day and then the next day coffee is bad for you, doesn't help. Saying it depends isn't really helpful to consumers. And we also have this complexity of celebrities and misinformation that is profound across social media and other media outlets where you see things like Gwyneth Paltrow's goop um, that is perpetuating uh, inaccurate nutrition information, sometimes dangerous nutrition information, as well as celebrities promoting junk food um, and these really send mixed messages, particularly in cultures where celebrity status is considered the end-all be-all and people really do uh, rely on um, what some of their favorite celebrities are endorsing. So there's a lot of assumptions about knowledge and education and, and how do we enhance knowledge and education for consumers to move towards better behaviors. So one assumption is that consumers need to know more about food systems, how they work, how they operate, what they produce, and their impacts on health and environment. Do consumers need to know the details of that? It's a question. Another assumption is that individuals who have nutrition-specific information and knowledge need to share that wisdom with others, especially younger people in their community. Is that necessary? Well, to kind of get a better handle on, on how these assumptions might play out in different interventions, I'm going to talk about these different strategies that are used to better inform and increase knowledge of consumers. Nutrition literacy programs, food package labeling, information on menus, nudges, mass media campaigns, culinary classes, and dietary guidelines. So nutrition literacy is defined as the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand nutrition information and skills needed in order to make appropriate nutrition decisions. So studies that suggest there's low nutrition literacy, it's been associated with things like less consultation of food labels or understanding and interpreting those food labels, challenges in estimating appropriate food portions, challenges in knowing what to buy, what's healthy, what's not healthy, and how to then cook those foods and with which ingredients. So there's a lot of gaps when uh, a person does not have the nutrition literacy um, at, their, at, their, at their fingertips. But it brings in questions around who, who should be nutrition literate, the cook, the shopper of the household, the influencer of the household, young people, because they're the ones who might solicit change in the household. What, what is the, what should a person be literate in? Food, or more specifically, nutrition, or more specifically, even more, environment literacy. The how. How do you inform and, and generate nutrition literacy? Websites, social media, 
reading materials, pamphlets, posters, gaming? What's the most effective way? And where should it be done? Hospitals and clinics when someone goes and sees the doctor? At schools? Community centers? Uh, book clubs? Where, where should this happen? And how do we get over some of the barriers, the stickiness of messages, the stickiness of information, to go in one ear and out the other? How do, how do you get people to remember it? The time it takes to become nutrition literate and the translation into context. What does that information mean to me? What does it mean for my situation, my life? Why would I care? These are some of the challenges that we need to think about when we're thinking about nutrition literacy. Another area of in generating knowledge or trying to are food labels. And we have the back of the pack labels. That's the ingredient list, the nutrition regulation in the United States. That's what the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, mandates. But the front of the pack is free game. And industry has abused that with a lot of misinformation uh, or exaggerations or just uh, kind of garbagey information that really doesn't mean anything like all natural. Um, but there is a move to provide regulated front of the pack labels. Some would call them warning labels or um, ratings of foods based on their content, their nutritional content. And a perfect example of this, what we talked about already was Chile where they put black stop signs on foods that were considered high in sugar, salts, and saturated fats. And um, this label is easy to read for consumers, which they always should be. Easy to read, easy to understand, could quickly glance at it. And what they did was that they regulated that food if it had those warning uh, stickers and that the food could not be advertised to children under the age of 14, and it couldn't be sold in or near schools. And the results of that have been quite profound in that they found that uh, the purchases of those foods with a warning sticker had declined about 24% um, since the initiation of the law uh, of food labeling. And they looked also at the different education categories under high school, those that completed high school and those that completed college, with the, those that completed college having a more profound effect. There's a, something to say about secondary or further education. Um, and they also compared it to their, their own, Chile's own sugar sweetened beverage tax purchases, Mexico's sugar sweetened beverage tax over a year and over two years. And you can really see the impact that this uh, food labeling and advertising law uh, has made in Chile. So a great example that other countries can emulate. Another really uh, popular, uh, not a label, but usually near the fresh fish counters. So fresh fish isn't going to have a label on it. It's not a processed packaged food, but uh, little cards that provide you uh, the best choices uh, of fish for sustainability reasons, good alternatives, and fish you should avoid. So for example, sturgeon, grouper, swordfish, shark is usually on the avoid list, whereas the best uh, choices are things like farmed Arctic char, Pacific halibut, um, oysters, mussels, all the shellfish are very sustainable. And they provide this very easy to look at guideline in what is sustainable and what's not from an ocean uh, thriving perspective. Menu labeling is another option. In the United States, as an example, as of 2018, calorie and nutrition information was required on menus in restaurants uh, with 20 or more locations. So that really put the responsibility on fast foods, fast casual restaurants. And this is just an example showing you in McDonald's, I believe it is, uh, the calories listed um, of foods. The Big Mac is uh, between 920 and 100, uh, 1,160 calories. And when they looked at the impact of the menus on calorie reductions overall across 
many studies, they showed that in 19 studies, there was an 18 kilocalorie reduction ordered per meal, um, which doesn't seem like a very big impact, does it? 18 kilocalories uh, is not much. So are people using the menus effectively to make decisions about food choices and what they're ordering? Possibly, but the impacts seem to be quite minimal. Nudge is another uh, important space that we're just learning about. A nudge is any aspect of the choice architecture that alters people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding or restricting options or significantly changing economic incentives. So the choice architecture are the interventions in a food environment, a store, a restaurant, that involve altering the properties or placement of objects or stimuli within microenvironments with the intention of changing health-related behaviors. So you can think of putting the salad bar in the middle of a cafeteria, smaller plates so you serve yourself less, um, having more sustainable uh, 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 forks and knives made with sustainable materials, no plastic, um, putting the junk food very hard to reach, not by the cash register. These are all the kind of choice, nudgy architecture type interventions. So a nudge should be easy, it should be cheap to avoid, and it should not involve a restriction. It's almost something that consumers don't really even notice. An example of a nudge that aims to increase food choice, for example, is like placing healthier foods at a closer distance compared with unhealthier foods. That's a very common thing. Or where food is positioned, you make the junk food or the junk the, the sugary cereals very hard to reach for a child's eye. They don't even see it, so they don't nag at their mom to buy those foods. These are all kind of nudges to try to elicit uh, uh, healthy behaviors. And just as a study, um, this study looked at, is nudging effective increasing the choice of fruits and vegetables? Choice being uh, servings, uh, choosing that food, the servings of that food, and the sales of that food. And it was a meta-analysis looking at several studies and they show that uh, nudging can be uh, uh, an effective intervention in increasing fruits and vegetable choices and altering placement and combined nudgements, the placement and the properties of that choice architecture have a pretty profound impact on food choice of fruits and vegetables. So um, this meta-analysis and systematic review showed that nudges can be uh, quite important in improving dietary intake. And there have been other studies showing this as well. Mass media campaigns is another option. Uh, intaking of fruits increased when this go for two and five in Australia. Um, there was a nine to 10% reduction in salt intake from this mass uh, media campaign in the UK. And uh, this pouring on the pounds is just showing a soda that turns into flat fat globules, which I remember living in New York City at that time. A lot of people were quite disgusted by this ad campaign. And 1.5 million New Yorkers surveyed said that they scaled back on soda consumption after seeing these uh, billboards plastered all over, all over uh, the subway system. So mass media campaigns can sometimes be effective if they really resonate with an individual, but there's a lot of ethical concerns around sort of scare tactics and et cetera. And there's a really great paper I've put here in the corner looking at a review of many of these different interventions I just talked about, mass media, uh, menu, food labeling, uh, school education, work wellness, um, that reviews a lot of that literature and the impacts of those different education interventions. Another is culinary skills. So culinary interventions like cooking classes have been used to try to improve the quality of dietary intake and change behavior that you can bring back to your own kitchen. This systematic review uh, looked at culinary interventions um, and showed that they were not associated with a significant change in cardiovascular disease risk factors 
um, but were associated with improving attitudes, self-efficacy, and healthier dietary intake in adults and children. This was all mainly done in the U.S. So um, uh, interesting findings about culinary skills. There's been a lot of interventions in low and middle income context of cooking demonstrations in communities. I'm a bit on the fence of whether or not these are effective, and there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that they are. One of the problems I've often found is that when you go to these co cooking demonstrations, they bring mothers with their children and they're watching under a mango tree someone cook these delicious meals. And these women go home and cannot afford the foods that were used uh, for the culinary demonstration. And so the context doesn't work in that space. It's a bit lost in translation because while the food looks delicious and there's so many things you can do with all the different foods that are found in their country, some of these women can't afford and these households can't afford the foods that were being used to cook with. And does it create long-term behavior changes is, is, left to be, uh, is left to be debated. And the last are dietary guidelines. Well, the United States has a dietary guideline that comes out every five years. There's many countries that have dietary guidelines. Uh, this is a review by Anna Herforth and colleagues showing you uh, countries that have uh, the number of countries of, with dietary guidelines. There's 90 dietary guidelines around the world, so only about half the countries in the world have a dietary guideline. Um, not many in Africa, only seven of 50 plus countries. Um, and here's Asia and Pacific, only 17. And here's different examples of, of uh, just different guidelines. This is uh, Sweden's guideline, very simple, easy messages. Here's Malta's guideline. And while many would argue that people don't read dietary guidelines, uh, they are important in shaping public procurement programs, food banks, school feeding programs across countries. They're used in public procurement systems and setting out standards of nutrition and food requirements of different age groups. And most of the guidelines generally have the same messages. So while an individual may not necessarily follow the dietary guidelines, governments use these guidelines that trickles down into many public programs uh, that uh, than consumers and citizens engage with. And last is, you know, that we're in a new world of nutrition education where people are using apps, they're using smartphones, they're using Apple Watches, smart devices that allow for them to track nutrition, allow them to track fitness and activity, allowing them to track their personal data, and their lifestyle is the precision and personalized nutrition era that we're moving into um, can be impactful in some populations, particularly those who are quantitative, which some of you are, um, that like numbers like tracking and staying organized. But this does not work for everybody. Some people lose interest quickly. They get fatigue uh, from having to input so much data. And so how do we make these uh, track trackers and devices do the work for us is a big question. Maybe some of you heard about Google, where you can take a picture of a food with your phone and it'll give you the nutritional composition of that meal. I don't really understand how that would work if you took a picture of, let's say, a stew and how Google would be able to pick out what those ingredients were and how it was made to come up with the nutritional composition of that, that, that meal seems mind-boggling to me. But with technology, these smart devices for personalized nutrition, personalized health, will just get better and better. So in this last module of week five, we're going to talk about choice and culture. And where do they weigh in when it comes time to behavior change and individual change. So we need to think about food choice. And when we think about food choice, there's many factors that influence that. One set of factors are soft cultural factors, social norms, meanings and interpretations, 
and assumptions we make about people, different types of populations, and the ways people live. The second set of factors are hard socioeconomic factors, income, how much someone makes, social class and status, geopolitics, biological factors, hunger, appetite, taste, palatability, factor in the food choice, and last are psychological factors, mood, stress, comfort, pleasure, pain, desire. All of these factors are influencing a person's decisions when they're making food choices. Tethered to those individual factors mentioned are environmental settings, where people live, where they engage, what kind of uh, places they prefer to spend their time, the different sectors of influence, health systems, agriculture systems, media, uh, industry, and then the sociocultural norms and values, the belief systems, religion, lifestyles, etc. All of these different settings, influences, and factors are playing a big role in the kinds of foods we eat, kind of activity we get, and our overall wellness and health. But choice is also very subjective. So when we think about food choices and diets, they invoke broader social and cultural meanings than just someone's reason, someone's desires, and someone's genetics. Inequality is probably one of the most important social factors and cultural factors shaping diets. And we can think about all of the inequities that we see across food systems and across marginalized or disadvantaged populations. And we can just figure out that there's a lot of inequality issues that we need to deal with. So when we look at this framework around not just food, but housing, education, money, there are um, a lot of different types of groups that are disadvantaged or marginalized. And, and this really impacts issues of affordability, availability of foods, behavior around foods, leading to uh, nutrition and health equity or inequalities. And um, when we think about uh, what we hold and value, does the society value diets? And if so, if we do value those diets, that could become a global norm. If that becomes a global norm, we then automatically would want to tackle the inequities and the inequalities that we see in food environments. And that also then would require massive societal change, um, not just individual change. So there's food choice and then there's food practices. Food choice is one element, but food practices is the carrying out, you've made a choice and what are the practices to instill those choices? So one is, the purchasing of foods, what kind of foods you buy, the preparation and cooking of those foods, the way in which a meal is composed, and the judgments of taste and aesthetics in the consumption of those foods. Each of these practices, of course, contributes to health and environmental outcomes. And of course, these practices are highly dependent, again, on equity issues. And when we think about choices, practices, and then the, the whole idea of eating and consumption, eating's not a good or bad or a list of do's and don'ts. Eating should be pleasurable and be a, a rewarding experience, whether or not you're filling your belly or you're fully enjoying the experience of a meal with friends and family around. Eating meals, meal times are really important opportunities for socializing and building relationships. And they're also very much tethered to traditional and cultural preferences um, in the way that those foods are consumed and, and chosen 
And I love these photos of these are young kids who are surrounding themselves with the types of foods that they eat in their local context. And, and this uh, book by uh, Greg Siegel shows you the, the incredible variety and traditions that these kids um, are growing up around um, and just shows you how the act of eating is very much tied to tradition, culture, and, and, and social surroundings. And last, when we think about choice and we think about uh, the freedom to choose the kind of foods we want, we need to be thinking broader about how our choices fit into the food system. I think I posed in last week's lecture this idea of do we have the right to eat wrongly? Well, I think we all know as global citizens, our choices in what we eat, how we participate in meals, how we participate in the larger food system has significant repercussions for our global neighbor halfway around the world. And part of when we think about food choice and we think about our choices and how we want to engage in the food system, we also need to be thinking about mobilizing our families, our friends, our communities, and rallying around this idea of sustainable and healthy diets and coming back to this idea of individual action. We need to vote with our fork. Who will be the leaders, the political leaders that will shape the food systems in the directions that we want them to go? And of course, advocate. So participate, advocate, mobilize to really uh, spur individual action and action in your local household, in your local community, in your local surroundings. See you next week.